Thank you very much, and thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would just say, though, as in the introduction, if I've had 40 years of experience, I'm now at the stage of my career where the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. So raise that as a caution at the outset. But nonetheless, I'm sure we'll have a, a good discussion. Just a little bit about my personal background. I won't go through it in detail, but just to say uh, I've always had a very keen interest in the operational side of logistics and how we can combine uh, the operational with the theoretical. And this presentation draws particularly on the last 30 years of project experience, which has been not exclusively, but it has been mainly in the food supply chain. So just looking at the pictures there on the left-hand side, uh, they illustrate a Brazil project that was looking at soya that was uh, being grown in the center-west states of Brazil and then being transported by both truck and train down to Santos and then loaded into vessels, bulk vessels, for shipping on to Europe and other locations. So that's just an illustration of the sort of work uh, that I've been doing over these past 30 years. But not so much about me. Let's, uh, let's, let's move on and look at the whole concept of the supply chain. The question comes up, is it just a simple pipeline or is it really a complex network? Uh, the answer is both. In many ways, it is a great advantage to think of it in, as a simple supply line, a pipeline from one end right the way through to the other. And this extended supply chain obviously has multiple stakeholders and handoffs as it goes through. But getting that visualization of the end to end, I think is very important. But of course, we have uh, complexity. And the way to make the complexity manageable, I've found, is to think of it in those three chunks, as it were. The primary producers, the agribusinesses involved in, in the production in the first place, then on into the manufacturers and processors, and then on to the retailers and caterers, who are the consumer facing part of the supply chain. Now, each of those three main categories obviously has a lot of subdivisions and they all have their own interests and needs. So when we're looking at the supply chain, it's very helpful to consider the roles of each one. How does a grower think? How does a processor think? How does a retailer think? And then underpinning this all the way through, especially over the last 50 or 60 years, we've really developed the idea of logistic services. Of course, there are other service providers as well, specialists in IT, we think about customs, think of all kinds of things, but just for the purposes of this discussion, helping us see the way logistic service providers have worked underpinning everything from the end-to-end -end supply chain. It's worth noting, of course, that those roles uh, can overlap. For example, uh, a grower and uh, a packer could also be a trader. They might be dealing directly with uh, the final uh, group, such as the retailers or the caterers. And you notice that last bullet point there, it speaks about different modes of appearance by category and by season. That's very important, just to illustrate. For example, if we're in Europe, uh, part of the year we'll be getting citrus from Spain or Italy. Other parts of the year, we could be getting citrus from uh, South Africa. Now, the South African citrus will obviously appear in the form of temperature control containers, whereas the uh, other traffic is far more likely to be in road trailers. So there's a lot in what might appear to be quite a simple pipeline. It's good to remember the complex or complexity of the network. And just to illustrate that in a little bit more detail, uh, this is an example of fresh produce coming up from Spain, and many of you will be familiar with this, uh, whether we're dealing with lettuce or, or celery or something else, sometimes organic, sometimes not. 
But just looking at the features, the way technology has been applied, so now within the operation on the field, we're then packing for final retail display. And that will include the pricing labels. It include everything else that was required for that product to be on the shelf at a retailer. So technology will continue to advance. And obviously at the moment, we've got a great deal of interest in robotics and how they're applied on the field. It's worth thinking about the way this is tightly controlled and also carefully planned. Uh, the second of those bullet points under features says production scheduled months in advance. And as we'll be familiar, we'll have nursery programs which are agreed and have to be adhered to before ever the crops are then put out in the field. And as far as policy makers are concerned, I think the decision making requirements are, are very important. Um, the growers, the packers, they need clarity, whether we're dealing with phytosanitary issues, customs entry, if we're looking at uh, adherence to competition law, so many different things have to be clearly stated and understood and communicated well in advance. Underpinning that, it's good to have a grasp of operational realities, know how it actually works. And just looking at those uh, uh, images there in the graphic, you can see how that all goes all the way through and it's good to be able to think, well, how does this really work? There's a lot of com complexity, which is not illustrated here. At the point of the areas in which we need to look. And as we are having a pragmatic approach to the data analysis, we live in a world where we're awash with data. Um, do we always understand the framework for that data? Sometimes we don't, in fact, often we don't. Um, just as an illustration, we may have data on values and volumes. Now, those need to be converted for transportation purposes into full trailer load equivalents. We can then get really complex and start breaking it into part load and so on. But just looking at that, what does that volume or what does that value mean in terms of vehicles? because it's those vehicles and those consignments which we're going to have to deal with as we go through the supply chain. So just wanted to use that as an illustration that if we're talking about the roles of all the different actors in the supply chain, if we're talking about how complex it is and how we need to understand the complexity, just thought it'd be useful to look at that illustration there uh, from, from Spain. So moving from roles, let's think for a few minutes about risks. What can possibly increase supply chain risk? As though anything possibly could. The key thing here, and once again, this is a, a distillation of some key points that have come out working with businesses over many years. And one of the things that strikes me at times is we live in a world where we have so much information and yet there's so much ignorance. Uh, I mentioned history and geography. In the uh, English academics world, we've tended to downplay history and geography. But then we end up with a situation where, as in one famous instance where a UK government planner was uh, questioning, well, why is there an extra transit time if I can't get through the Suez Canal and I have to come round the Cape of Good Hope? I mean, that's, that's pretty basic if we're looking at food supply from all around the world. But that's the kind of thing that was not even recognized. Another one that comes up a lot is this uh, demarcation distinction between a container and a road trailer. Because after all, you say, well, actually, a container, when it's moved off the vessel, off the ship, comes onto a trailer, and surely then it, it becomes a road unit. But if we're looking at cross, if we're looking at ports and looking at cross-border transactions here, it's very important for us to understand the difference between a road trailer, where we've got an integrated bridge unit, for example, and we load straight into the back of the trailer, 
and a lift on lift off container which can be used in different modes around the world and if you read articles carefully for example you'll read a business paper article and it'll talk about um, trailers for example and then the journalist then starts talking about containers well they're two completely different animals but there needs to be an understanding of that the same way alluded to ports different types of ports a port that handles roll on roll off traffic has to be configured completely differently from one that is handling container traffic and we've got other issues surrounding that so i just mentioned that point about ignorance uh, sometimes it's all pervasive and sometimes we can be a little bit lazy and think well okay i can google that at the right time um, no it's necessary and it causes problems causes risk when we don't have the right understanding won't worry about the attitude to logistics for the moment, but just moving on to cultures. As you probably gathered, I, I worked a fair bit, number of years in and out of Brazil on international supply chains. Difference in organizational culture. A Brazilian manufacturer, for example, will come from the mindset, and with all due respect to any Brazilians listening, because I love Brazil, the mindset is, when I've made it, you can have it. And if I decide to reallocate this month's production to another market, well, too bad, you'll have to wait for the next month. Now, by contrast, if we look at, say, the way the retail community in Europe, and I'm thinking, for example, the UK retailers, the whole thing there is they are the ones controlling it and they have their expectations. So that's a different way of thinking. We wouldn't dream of selling it to the client when in fact, or to the final customer, when we've got it, but rather we make sure we've got on time availability all the way through. New political scenarios. Well, that's a hot potato at the moment, isn't it? Think about what's happening with the Northern Ireland protocol and all the issues to do with the borders there. But the point is, as far as risks, things that we thought were established suddenly change or they change with increasing pace and we don't always understand the implications of those changes. So that's a serious point that can increase supply chain risk. Final point, supply chain ownership and control. Yes, I mentioned the way the retailers, for example, UK retailers have tried to have exercise control right the way back to that field and that planting program we were talking about earlier. Uh, they do that with different levels of success and there are once again there are issues that can appear so who in fact has got the ownership of the supply chain do they have the power to plan and respond and do they have the visibility of what's necessary to make the right decisions so all of those factors together are a view of what can actually increase supply chain risk just to illustrate some of those points in a little bit more detail uh, going back to that point of ignorance, this slide looks at various aspects to do with ports and shipping. Um, now, just looking at the pictures at the bottom there, first of all, we see we've got a roll-on, roll-off ferry in the bottom, life, uh, bottom left uh, corner, uh, where road trailers will be driving off that. In that particular case, that happens to be Dover. Um, we're looking at the sort of vehicle that can go on that, see the sole store truck on the right hand side, and that is where we have uh, a road trailer. On the other hand, you look at the vehicle alongside it, that's a shot taken a few years ago with Chilean containers coming in from uh, at Felixstowe, where the container has to be lifted on and off the ship and then onto the truck. The final one gives us a pipeline for palm oil. In fact, that's palm oil being pumped out of a bulk tanker in the north of England. And of course, the palm oil, well, not of course, but the palm oil has to be heated uh, before it can flow freely out of the ship's tanks through the pipeline. That just illustrates that certainly it's not one size fits all. It's important to realize the differences. 
The same way, if we want to make sure we're not ignorant about the way a port terminal works, the diagram on the left-hand side there is to do with a roll-on, roll-off port. And you think, well, that's, that, that's very interesting. What's the significance? Well, you'll notice that both for inbound and outbound flows, there is an opportunity to park unaccompanied trailers. That's fine. So it doesn't have a tractor unit, means the trailer can sit at the port until a tractor unit arrives, couples up and takes it away. But do you have enough parking? Well, the answer is, yeah, we've got plenty of space. But what about the quality of that space? If, for example, it's tarmac, then fine, we drop the trailer legs and they go straight through the tarmac. We need proper hard standing. We need it to be concreted or else we need to put um, boards underneath the trailer legs. Things like that completely uh, can completely compromise the effectiveness of a port. So it's very easy to say, OK, well, we'll just move trailer traffic. We'll have a sort of a company traffic coming through. We'll go to unaccompanied traffic. There are lots of other issues, for example, to do with border inspection. Uh, one of the ports, for example, pre-Brexit, Trailers coming through one minute per pass per vehicle for the passport check. Now, if I'm then going to start doing anything else, for example, even if I'm going to do something as simple as a seal check at the back of the trailer, back of the vehicle, um, that completely throws my schedule. So once again, this is my point about ignorance. It's not a good idea to be ignorant, it's essential that we get to understand these elements because otherwise we are increasing our supply chain risk. And you may find the checklist and the bullet points in the right hand box there helpful. Distinguishes between roll on, roll off surfaces of different types and also lift on, lift off surfaces. It also makes a reference to bulk travel, uh, bulk traffic, as we saw with that palm oil tanker. And then the different elements that are applied for checks to cross-border traffic can be looked at there. It's all important and it's hugely important because, as you know, another risk that's affected us in Europe in recent years, organised criminal gangs trafficking people. And sometimes I've been thinking that a fresh produce trailer is the vehicle of choice if they can get migrants into that. So that, that's yet another issue which uh, comes into this uh, issue or discussion of the issues around supply chain risks. So just move quickly now onto the area of um, uh, how do we prepare and what are the, uh, the role, what are the things each person can do um, to make sure we are in fact uh, you know, managing things in an effective way. This checklist to do with preparing and responding effectively is, 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 as it were, a summary of a number of the different things. So what do we need to do? Watch the world, be aware of what's going on. Going back to mapping the supply chain processes, those players that have got a good view of their supply chain, how it works, and then where the dependencies are, these are the ones that will actually work effectively. So recognizing the dependencies and tied in with that, this matter of always listening and communicating, especially these days, rather than saying, well, this is how we do it and you must do it accordingly. Listening, communicating within the organization, upwards, downwards, alongside, and then with external parties as well especially those who are providing the services. And whereas logistics not being viewed as, as the poor relation, rather striving for logistics excellence and successful organizations are promoting best practice across the network. This enables preparation of proper scenarios and doing proper training. You might say, well, yeah, but training doesn't uh, necessarily prepare us for what's going to happen. No, but if we get used to working together in line with the points that we've just described up there, 
a trained team who can communicate and do that along the whole extended supply chain. That's the team that can handle things quickly and effectively in a responsive way. So, to summarize business contingency planning. Is it a simple pipeline or a complex network? The answer is both. There's value in both perspectives. What can increase supply chain risk? We've looked at five of the negative aspects, including ignorance. What do resilient food businesses do? They watch the world. They map the supply chain and its dependencies. They listen and communicate internally and externally. They promote best practice and they have informed and well-trained teams. Thank you for your attention.